All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us here today for this very special Property Insights. Um, what I'd like to do is, first of all, um, thank you for joining us today um, for the first Property Insights of the year. Um, it's quite special because we have Akansha, who I'd like to introduce to you. Um, she is now going to be the head of this initiative, so you'll be getting to know her um, pretty, free, you know, on our calls pretty frequently. And of course, we have Kate Agnew, who is on the um, advisory board of Women in Prop Tech, joining us um, here today as the curator, who has invited the wonderful guests um, to um, to speak on this very important topic about returning to work. Um, it's quite timely. We were meant to hold this um, towards the end of last year. But out of realizing that not many people had returned to work, we decided to um, delay it somewhat. So um, I will mention also that this call is being recorded. Um, so this is going to be um, saved on the Women in Prop Tech website, which is um, you know, in the um, catalog of videos, which is available to our members. Um, we'll also have it on the front of our website for, um, for a limited time in case you miss out on some of this. Um, it's gonna be a, a fantastic um, event. Um, we're very fortunate because we've been allocated a 90 minute time slot to be able to do this. So there will be plenty of time to um, ask questions and have an engaging dialogue with fantastic panelists that we have here today. So without further ado, I'd like to induce, um, introduce you to Akansha and she will take it from here. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Nikki. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Happy New Year. Um, I hope everyone has had a pleasant day so far. Uh, as Nikki introduced me, my name is Akansha Sharma, a uh, very new member of the advisory committee here uh, at Women in Prop Tech, uh, and welcome to the first event of, uh, of the year. So happy to see you all could join. So um, today we're going to talk about a very hot topic, as you all know, go back to work and associated successes and challenges. I think uh, by now, most of us have uh, established uh, a new normal in our uh, professional and personal lives considering COVID-19. Um, but I'm also sure that, you know, all of us are looking forward to seeing what uh, lies ahead of us. Uh, you know, you can say in anticipation of achieving some sort of pre-COVID normalcy. Uh, personally, for me, I know that normalcy will have to do a lot with going back into the office uh, and not working from home. I, I know that for some of you, uh, those definitions might be a little different. Um, and I do recognize these definitions have been evolving over the past few months, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot more to come. Um, Going back to the topic, you know, this topic of going back to work has been discussed extensively over the past several months. Uh, we've been hearing about things uh, such as flexible and remote working, uh, changing office layouts, uh, social distancing, and other things along those lines. However, um, our discussion today goes beyond some of these topics that have been widely discussed in the, in the industry. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, and touch upon environmental health and safety concerns of going back to work. Uh, we're gonna discuss the hospitality side of things. And uh, last but not least, we're gonna talk about how we can leverage uh, technology and innovation to achieve and um, streamline several operational nuances and changes that lie ahead of us. With that, um, I'm gonna quickly uh, give you an overview of our speakers today. Uh, we have three speakers today. Our first speaker is Jennifer Carey. Jennifer is the founder and CEO of GLC Environmental Consultants, uh, which is a leader provider of environmental due diligence testing, risk assessment, and mitigation oversight services for real estate and construction industry. Our, spec our second speaker is Daniel Lesser. Um, Daniel is the president and CEO of LW Hospitality Advisors. Uh, he has 40 years of specialized uh, experience in the, in the hospitality sector, ranging from uh, real estate appraisals to uh, uh, economic feasibility, investment asset management, and transactions management. A third speaker is uh, Rachel Merva. Um, Rachel, is the founder and principal of uh, RM Consulting in, in New York City. She formerly was senior director and head of finance and operations at Alliance Real Estate Americas. Uh, Rachel has been extensively involved in integrating uh, prop tech applications in commercial real estate lending, um, asset management, 
due diligence uh, in the entire gamut of uh, project management and finance and operations. With that, um, I would like to turn it over to Kate Agnew. Uh, again, thank you, Kate, uh, for lining up these excellent speakers for us today. Um, and before, one quick thing before we uh, dive in, you know, I, I do want to mention that if throughout the discussion you have any questions, uh, please feel free to type them in the chat window of Zoom and we'll address them towards the end. Um, with that, Kate, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I'm not going to introduce myself because I'm looking at the wonderful people on the call and I've known some of you for many years and some of you for not as many years, but as intimately, but I'm Kate Agnew. It sure is great to see you guys again. Um, we have three really highly experienced professionals that are on the call today, and they're going to be stitching together the beginning, the middle, and the end of how we're seeing prop tech threading through everything we're doing. Jennifer Carey is a friend of mine I've known for many years. Her environmental um, efforts on behalf of understanding what's going on and what we have now and how we're going to approach it in the future, I think is going to be critical to our return to work challenges and understanding. Return to work is something interesting because we've all been working as hard, if not twice as hard, since we're going on, but approaching our next normal is going to be something that's interesting. So Karen, uh, Jennifer's going to kick it off. From there, we have Dan Lesser, and he's one of our preeminent experts in the hospitality industry. He's involved in that from the beginning to the end, and it's argue, not arguably the hardest hit part of the real estate industry. Being able to go into this, Dan's going to give us insight into how the hospitality providers of this world are going to make us comfortable through using PropTech in coming to terms with coming back into the incredible things of both business and pleasure from a safety perspective and property. So the last part is, last and not least, is Rachel. Rachel's gonna stitch it all together of the reporting, not only what the results are as we're moving through this crisis and how PropTech is helping us get there, but also as we're gonna be reporting our highs, our lows through the property technology that we're receiving. So with that, if I can uh, turn to Jennifer Carey to kick us off. Jennifer, can you give us some more detail about your what you're involved in now? Great, thanks so much, Kate, and thanks so much for having me. Um, uh, Women in Prop Tech is a great um, organization because we do need more Prop Tech in the CRE field. I mean, it's been a slow adoption, um, and from the environmental side, I'm the founder and CEO of JLC Environmental Consultants, and we've been providing testing from asbestos to zinc on any kind of real estate or construction project from uh, in the general, uh, in the greater New York area, as well as nationally and internationally for over 30 years. So we've seen a lot of stuff and we actually specialized a lot of right now, and actually for the last 15 or 20 years or so, when we ha I had a death in my family from Legionnaire's disease, where we got into microbiological testing, uh, whether it's hospitals or, um, you know, residential apartments or commercial real estate. So we have been doing a lot of, um, of work in this field for a long time. And Honestly, um, I told people when this, the COVID first um, hit that it would probably be an 18 month period to prepare yourself mentally for it, not to have enough food in your house for 18 months, but mentally be prepared that we would have these kind of shutdowns. So um, I'm only, and I, the other day I realized we're only at nine months and I think I might've been premature. I think, you know, there will be an eight, maybe a 24 month period. So we're actually nine months into a 24 month cycle that it may and that, that's just guesstimating from the past experiences of other pandemics but what they say in epidemiology is once you've seen one pandemic you've seen one pandemic you you can't you can take some lessons but everything acts differently you know so anyway um i think the last year was an inflection point and cre especially for intensifying the need for adoption of, of, of tech and, and technical solutions for property management COVID pushed it to the tipping point. Um, and there was, you know, before I think of financial like hesitancy to really, and what you wanted people to be close by, but this kind of tipped it over to the point where you need to have this kind of, you know, a solution. Thank God our company was already, a lot of our people were already digital because we work late, we work weird hours, we do a lot of emergency stuff. So um, anyway, so digital adoption has taken quantum leaps over the past, you know, nine months at least, and, and even before that, it was it was was working its way through, but slower. So I think um, the winners in a competitive and business environment will be those who do adopt uh, and, and re re reap these uh, these cost savings and the operational efficiencies that 
you get when, a, when you have a fully realized technical platform. Now that's easier said than done. In my company, we're a small business. By the way, how many people by the show of hands are for big companies or, or from, uh, how many people work for big companies? Show of hands, small companies. Yeah, so you know we have a mixture of people. So a larger company is gonna have a different perspective on what a smaller company can do, but we, we're trying to, there's apps out there for our people to use and we're trying to adopt some more technology, but because of our having legal documents that have to be made out in the field, we have a little bit of sometimes a disconnect, but we're working on working that through in our area. Um, and that's just for our particular things that we do in environmental, which is testing and air quality and soil quality and so forth. But um, but I think that, you know, adopting other strategies, like especially like, you know, someone mentioned, I think it was Ms. Sharma, that we people are, or maybe it was Kate, that we're, we're doing more social distancing at work. We're going to re re allocating space and increasing ventilation and other kinds of uh, mechanical and operational um, efficiencies that we can implement so that people can feel safe. Because if people don't feel safe, they won't come back. And I've been on several calls where people have been um, very upset and not, I mean, I know people that they say they're not, Bank of America, for example, or something is not coming back to work for all of 2021. So what does that mean? It means that there's going to be a lot of real estate that's going to need some TLC in the near future. So we're, you know, having the having the tools to reoccupy spaces when it comes to that time is going to be very important. For example, I don't know if anyone thought about it, but if you're in a big building, an office building, and the water hasn't been run for weeks and months, we do a lot of testing on water that's been sitting in pipes. So, you know, obviously they're going to have these flushing, you know, there's going to have to be, you know, flushing of buildings. There's going to have to be um, other types of, uh, you know, we use at our office, for example, uh, different kinds of technologies that are uh, that kill antimicrobials by by micro um, micro uh, nanotechnology, where you touch something and it automatically disinfects. So those are things that small and large companies can adopt both. So I mean, my experience has been, as I said, environmental science, and I was a biologist, and um, my I think I don't have claim to fame, but I was one time on Good Morning America talking about water quality for the winter for the Rio Summer Olympics a couple of years ago. So we get called for all different things, and I think that um, having the resiliency in your company, wherever you are in your firms, if you're putting this tech in place or you're implementing the tech, having a strategy, then the path to implementation, and then developing your plan and then revising it as needed when something like a COVID hits or when something like um, you know what happened at the uh, whatever happened, whatever kind of emergency could happen, you know, whether it's, you know, a, a, a protest and you had someone break, you know, like what was happening, you know, in New York where people boarded buildings or whatever, it, whatever the case may be, having having that strategy, your path to implementation and your plan in place is going to be in crucial to the implementation of any kind of property technology you're going to use. And as uh, I looked at McKinsey and Company, I was looking at some research to get ready for today. And I saw McKinsey and Company in October 2020's report came out and said 61% of companies have adopted one tech solution, but only 28% have adopted multiple strategies. So those who are in the business of selling these strategies or these technological applications, are, they have a, you have a lot of sales opportunities available to you. And those who have to purchase them, you know, you have to do your due diligence. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to mention um, and uh, about when you do get back to work. For example, in our company, we, we made a, a, a plan as you probably all have, and you have a certain um, rotating schedule. That's what we use. We only have a 30 person firm, so we're smaller. We're, I mean, I don't know how like uh, Ernest and Young or uh, you know any of these really huge companies would be able, are doing it. And I'd like to hear from some of you during the time when we have to talk uh, because it's interesting to me, but um, addressing your requirements, reviewing your systems and making sure that you know what you're required to do. I was on, I'm a, a Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business um, owners a program uh, alumni, and we've been working with people on the Hill to cr help more small businesses survive this whole economic situation we're in. And small businesses, you know, every every small business, every large business that you that you see in the world was once a small business. So when we, our hashtag today was lose small, lose big. So those, you know, those people that we were talking to, um, they want to. Um, work with you know companies to give them the opportunity to know to, and one of the guys was saying i don't know i'm i'm in the pest control business and i don't know what i'm supposed to be doing i have the cdc and i have the hhs and i have new york state telling me what to do in new york city and so i have all these different you know where can i get the information and that's where everyone will have to find out what applies to them and do the research and that that's your job 
that's your that's going to be what you have to do well once you find out what that is then you can do it um you have to remind and, and you know leadership comes from the head down and hopefully your, your leadership team is involved with implementing this and i don't know if anyone saw the video of tom or the heard the viral thing of tom cruise going that went viral tom cruise on mission impossible set was yelling at his staff and, and using a lot of they had a blanket out a lot but i was surprised that tom cruise who's not really afraid of anything even like mental illness was like um he was screaming at them that they were not following the COVID rules and if they ever he ever saw him do it again they would be effing fired and i was like whoa tom cruise is very interested in being safe from COVID." so i mean you don't want that but you want to have your leadership telling people from the top down that you have to wear this or you have to do this or you have to follow these uh, we had a guy in our office who wouldn't do his daily health check we're like this is this is poker stakes. If you can't do that, then you're gonna have to go. Um, you're gonna have to leave. So we were, you know, it was like, I don't know what his mental issue was, but it was like you can't go out in the field every day, especially some of our clients require us to do a second COVID check before we go to their site, without filling in those forms. So those are your requirements. Know your poker stakes. Plan ahead for any potential setbacks. That would be the last part of the problem. And I think I've gone over my. I don't know if I've gone to my time, but. I don't know if I kind of, I kind of kind of kept it big picture, Kate. I don't know if I got down into the nitty gritty that you want to talk about. Some of the projects we're working on are like the new Ruth Bader Ginsburg office building in Brooklyn that's going to be a new um, courthouse. Well, it is a courthouse, but it's going to get renovated. We're doing a job at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. We're doing some, we actually have worked in some hotels, which I know Dan's going to talk about hotels and hospitality, where we went in and the Marriott had a disinfect room. So we've gone in and helped them where we do swipes and swabs afterward and see you know, the efficacy of the efforts of the dis disinfection. Now, those are kind of very expensive things to do. And in the beginning, people were more going for that. But now I think because we know that you could go in and disinfect and the next day, someone can go by and infect it all again. Maybe that's not the best place to put our money, but there, there, no, those are different things. And again, every situation, every workplace is going to be different. So you have to have someone really focused on that. And unfortunately, it's going to be a, a you know, like a, a cost that's going to be added to all of our, you know, bottom lines for the, the foreseeable future, but it will eventually work itself out. And I do feel, unfortunately, that just like there's a flu season every year, there's going to be a COVID's never going away at this point because we kind of lost the opportunity to put that genie back in the bottle. So just know that we'll always have to have a co maybe it'll be a flu season like a COVID season. I'm not to be a Debbie Downer, but you know this is this is the new normal. So we're we're talking about new normal. Get our mind around it, and once we accept it, I think it's it's much easier to go forward and not be so like woeful that the past is the past and the future looks so dim. I think the future still looks bright, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the other speakers. So um, I I yield my time as they were just talking about <laughs> today when I was watching some of the news. I yield my time back to Kate Agnew. Okay, thank you. Kate Agno accepts it. Jennifer, I'm going to come back to you with some questions because I want to come back to what you're talking about on the Ruth Bader Ginsburg courtyard. Courtyard. Now I've crossed Marriott Courtyard and Courthouse. But I'd like to come back to that to understand how the technology systems that are in there are going to make it a safer building. Next up, I am really excited about hearing from Dan. Dan has uh, got a really big remit, as we say, out in the market to. Uh, bring the hospitality industry back to us, bring the fun of it while still being safe and how property technology can fold into that. So Dan, can I turn to you to walk us through some of the good things? Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Great. Well, thank you so much for the invite. Um, I'm, I'm flattered to, to join and talk about the, um, the hotel industry, which is uh, one of two passions in my life, my family and, and what I do. So how do I take control of the, because um, I have the presentation, or do you guys have the presentation? You should be a co-host and be able to ever... pull it up on your own. Okay, but how do I take control at this point? Um, if you see share screen down the bottom, the little green button. Yes. Can you see Ooh, it? it? Looks like it's working. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, terrific. Wow, cool. So yeah, uh, thank you again for, for the invite. Um, so the, as Kate said, the hotel industry, uh, hardest hit sector um, in terms of, uh, you know, real estate assets. I know a lot to talk about retail, but I, I think lodging at this point may, may beat it out. So um, 
you know, I'd like to just start off for a minute. You know, most of this is obvious. I'm sure, you know, anybody who's in real estate and, you know, has stayed in hotels knows that, you know, hotels are different asset classes, right, compared to other forms of commercial real estate, right? Um, you know, office buildings, shopping centers, uh, they're, you know, typically encumbered with uh, long-term leases, many times creditworthy uh, uh, tenancies. Uh, and once you lease up a building, you can figure out what your expenses are and, you know, pretty much creating an annuity, right? With a hotel, you're leasing up guest rooms every single night. And with technology being what it is, uh, the pricing of guest rooms literally changes by the nanosecond. You know, hotel investments are, are fairly complicated because you have all sorts of different parties, whether it be an owner sponsor, um, third party equity, a lender, a property manager, maybe even a, a, a licensed brand. And there's all these parties that it's difficult to get all the, uh, uh, you know, everybody's interests aligned, if you will. Um, and so, uh, you know, also highly leveraged, high fixed costs, and uh, tremendous reliance on on intermediaries, right? So if you think about it, if the, if the airline industry is not is not running, um, or running well, it affects the the lodging industry, right? And think about hotels on islands, right? How do you get there without airlift? Um, so just to kind of set a backdrop for a minute about uh, about the sector right before COVID. Um, we were experiencing 10 years of, of, of growth uh, every in the past couple of years prior, you know, starting with 19 going back were, were records. Uh, uh, each month ended up being a record. Now the growth rate was slowing and there was a lot of concern about that. Um, but, you know, everything's relative in life, right? It was growth nonetheless, although it was decreasing. And everybody was talking about black swan, black swan, black swan. Of course, nobody knew what that was ultimately going to be. We now know um, what it was, uh, what it ended up being. And, and from a profitability perspective, again, all time highs. And then um, it, it essentially life fell off the, uh, the cliff. And, and uh, revenue per available room is, is a metric that's looked at in, in the lodging sector, which is essentially a simple calculation of occupancy times room rate. And you know, this slide goes back and, and shows a change in revenue per available room. And you, you, know, you can see in the early 90s, uh, if anybody was around then, I was around then, you know, there, was, uh, there was what was at that point perceived as a deep recession, right? 9-11, right, uh, uh, the lodging industry fell off a cliff and that was earth shattering at 23% decline in revenue per available room. And then the great financial crisis at, uh, at, at 20%, right? Again, those were oh my God moments, the 20 and 23. And then look what happened this year, right? So compared to this year, uh, those oh my God moments were just blips on the screen, right? So everything, everything is relative in life. Um, the American Hotel and Lodging Association, uh, terrific uh, uh, lobby that represents the, the hotel business um, in Washington, and they do an amazing job. They really do. Um, this was a roadmap that they sort of put together uh, very early on of, of how, how the sector was going to come out of this. Now, there's no timing attached to this. Uh, but it, it is a very, you know, logical overview of, of what's going to need to happen before recovery act actually occurs. And it's interesting that we're talking about uh, technology because the hotel industry has notoriously been behind the curve when it comes to technology. I mean, we could, we could spend a whole hour talking about that from a historical perspective. But what's really interesting is that COVID has finally gotten technology front and center with the hotel sector. And the hotel sector, it will be now ahead of the curve and they'll remain ahead of the curve, but it took COVID to make that happen. So, you know, as we move on, right, the pandemic came and, and obviously decimated the sector and, and uh, you know, lots of hotels ended up closing uh, fairly quickly, but you also had some, you know, creativity, um, you know, before you close, which is an expensive proposition because it's also expensive to reopen, right? Um, you know, getting creative and coming up with uh, all temporary alternative uses for hotels, whether it be emergency housing for first responders. We saw our hotels end up uh, setting up trading floors, uh, um, 
you know, rooms for homeless folks. I mean, that that's a whole thing onto itself. Last quarter of 20, there were uh, uh, 10 trades in California of decent hotel select service properties that sold for conversion to uh, homeless shelters. And, uh, and they sold at some pretty healthy numbers as well. Um, you know, as time has gone on and, and, and the sector's trying to figure out how to, you know, how to come out of, of, uh, of this, you know, group meeting and convention is really the, the hardest hit segment of the, uh, of the sector. You typically have three major segments, um, um, corporate, individual travelers, um, um, leisure traffic and group meeting and convention. And, and we're all, we're on Zoom, right? Nobody's going to meetings and conventions anymore. And so, um, um, you know, Hilton's been one of the, one of the groups at sort of the forefront of, of uh, you know, creating remote workspaces to get out of the house, right? Um, you know, I happen to be fortunate. I live in a big home and my, our kids are out. So, you know, I have lots of room, but, you know, a lot of folks don't. So, you know, trying to figure out alternative uses for hotel rooms. Um, so that, that, you know, that, that's been something. And then on the meeting side, um, you know, figuring out how to do hybrid meetings, right? Uh, I, I can tell you that in, in, the, in the hotel uh, um, um, uh, meeting world, I'm talking about the hotel investment community, um, we haven't had an event in quite some time uh, in person. Um, but it looks like we're going to have probably the first one in the sector uh, uh, come uh, May, and it's going to be a hybrid event. Um, so that really is kind of the way of the future, right? You know, holding group meetings and conventions, but not whereby everybody needs to show up in person. Um, you know, it is interesting. The 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 uh, the first thing that that popped up, right, right, you know, with COVID was you know, the notion of bacteria and, and dirt and, you know, cleanliness became a huge thing, right? You know, the reality is that, and it's unfortunate that, you know, pre-COVID, um, these are headlines from pre-COVID of uh, just, you know, uh, cleanliness and sanitation being an issue for the sector going back uh, quite some time. And so uh, the American Hotel and Lodging Association, again, they were very shrewd and smart and stepped up very quickly to create this uh, safe stay uh, industry-wide hotel cleaning standards. And you can see that from the advisory board, it's, it's really a who's who of who's in, the, uh, who, who's in the lodging sector. And they came up with this great protocol. And then each one of the uh, brand families decided to take it even further and come out with their own sort of spin on cleanliness, right? Hilton hooking up with Lysol, um, um, you know, everybody was making sort of a thing about cleaning and trying to get competitive in part based on cleaning, which is kind of absurd when you think about it, right? It's like, really, you're gonna start competing on cleanliness after you came up with a program industry-wide uh, um, to deal with it. So kind of a bad move, but they did it anyway. And the sad thing is that all these headlines are post COVID, like post April 1st, if you will. And it's kind of unfortunate. It seems like the sector really hasn't, uh, <laughs> hasn't really gained anything you know, from all this noise, if you will. So that, that continues to be quite a challenge, right? I can tell you that I have been very diligent about being hunkered down for 10, 11 months now. Um, I never, frankly, felt comfortable staying in, in hotels. I, I'm a hotel guy, right? I, you, all you got to do is look underneath the bed, right? And it doesn't matter if you're in a five-star hotel. You know, it, 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 this is reality. I mean, uh, you know, I didn't make this up, all these the, these headlines, either current or, or going back. And so I I haven't stayed in a hotel since, since uh, the beginning, and I'm not there yet. I also haven't been on an airplane, but again. Um, so... You know, it's interesting after prior um, off the cliff events, whether it be 9-11 or the great financial crisis, um, you know, we've, we've, we've seen this movie before in terms of the, the demand and the way, it, the pattern that it's going to come back in, right? You're going to get leisure traffic first, particularly drive to leisure. And we already saw that this past summer. 
The next thing that's going to uh, um, uh, rebound is corporate business travel, right? That's going to come after after. And as I said a minute ago, um, you know, group meeting and convention is going to be the last to come back. And and I think as time goes on, when we look back, um, the 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 real opportunities are going to bubble up with big box convention hotels in downtown urban cores. I'm talking about thousand to two thousand room hotels that are closed at this point, right? Because there's just, there's no group meeting and convention business out there. Uh, I, I think when, when when those bubble up in the debt markets, um, there are gonna be some assets that are gonna trade at, at fractions of replacement cost. Uh, so, so, you know, the new normal, um, I, I love this quote. I mean, quite, quite frankly, I was born a germaphobe. So, you know, COVID was right down my strike zone. But when Anthony Fauci came out with this, I mean, I think this is going to be one of the first things of the new normal. Um, you know, when we before we get to talking about hotels, just paradigm shifts that are going to occur, you know, uh, um, many of which are in part due to technology um, in travel patterns, right? Not just hospitality. I mean, face masks on airlines, they're not going away anytime soon. Um, you know, the notion of, of, of there's lots of masks, masks out there where you know, you can see somebody's entire face. This is not the only one, but I think we're going to see more and more of that. And I think it's actually going to start in the hotel sector, because if you think about it, hospitality, you know, is akin to welcoming somebody into your home, right? Well, if you have a mask on, it's, you know, and we have to wear a mask, right? There's no doubt about that. But I think you're going to see the sector really adopt, you know, clear, clear masks to make it, you know, more, more human, if you will. Um, you know, technology, um, you know, basically having a COVID passport, right? Uh, that you're COVID free, you know, 24 hours before getting on a plane. That's That, that technology is already available. And it's going to, as people start traveling, um, I mean, I'm sure folks that travel on this, I'm a member of Clear, right? It's very easy to bolt on your, your, your um, you know, getting a test and, 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 and being COVID free before getting on an airplane. This is going to become, you know, as common as as going through TSA uh, became after 9-11. Um, you know, it's interesting. We're, we're, we're seeing uh, lots and lots of folks resort to just, again, drive to, right? And uh, millennials are, are flocking to recreational vehicles like, like never before. Um, they, uh, they're becoming, very, they have become very, very popular. So some of the paradigm shifts within the within specifically the lodging sector, um, use of robotics, um, upper left hand corner, you know, germ killing UV robots are already being used um, on the top uh, two in, you know, you know, robots are being used to deliver uh, 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 items uh, to to guest rooms, right? And also robots are already being used in 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 restaurant facilities within hotels to deliver food to guests. Grab and, co grab and go is going to be a much, it's already here. It's been here, but it's going to really take off at this point. You know, breakfast buffets are completely over with. You'll never see that again. Um, having fitness available, you know, within, within a, a guest room. Um, Hilton's uh, brand, if you will, on that is essentially five feet to fitness. So I think we're going to see more and more of this. Mini bars, I, I think, are kind of out of style at this point. You know, smoking prohibited in in casinos, right? Uh, I, I think that that's really going to be done. I, I, it's it's a liability if you think about it to, uh, um, you know, to to sort of allow that, which only weakens immune systems, right? Uh, contactless everything, right? And this is all technology based, and it's all going to be based on our phones, right? Uh, it's pretty logical, right? Whether it be digital concierge facial recognition, to check in, uh, uh, to, to, to ask for anything, quite frankly. It's contactless, that's, that's, that's really where it's at. Nobody wants to touch anything anymore and really shouldn't have to, right? By using available technology, it's already available. So, you know, these products and services are just gonna have to, you know, become um, adopted. We, we, Marriott has already come out and mobile, Mobile access, uh, key access is a brand standard that is gonna have to happen within the next 12 months. It's not a choice. And we're gonna see more and more of these, of these uh, initiatives become brand standards. 
And uh, finally, you know, I would just wrap it up by, uh, you know, the, the lodging sector is very volatile and um, expect the unexpected is sort of the, the uh, you know, the way forward. And I thank you very much. I yield my time. I'm starting to uh, to like that uh, that phrase now. So, uh, Dan, as always, brilliant. And I do know that we're going to be making the slides available to everyone else. It would be interesting to have a conversation crossover between you and Jennifer, because it sounds like the monitoring and the prop tech things are are are, are going there to make hospitality work out a lot better for us. And then um, we're delighted that our next speaker now is Rachel, who's going to take it home for us. We've started at the physical side of it. We've moved into the operational side of it. And now since we're all in this business to make money, Rachel's going to show us how the technology solutions are making everything that's been happening through our and into our next normal uh, reportable and hopefully into our pockets. Great. Well, thank you so much um, for the opportunity to participate in this panel. Uh, thanks so much to Kate and, and, and the rest of the, the women in PropTech team. So for context, I got my start in commercial real estate, managing a portfolio of single family loans from four failed banks in the early 90s, the famous SNL crisis. Anybody remember Dollar Dry Dock Bank? That was one of them. We foreclosed, completed note sales, restructures, and discounted payoffs, all with internal databases and an Excel as the tools of choice until the assets were all gone. Uh, moving over into banking next, I worked for the CFO for the next decade or so. And during my tenure, I was at Hypo Real Estate. I flexed my prop tech muscle, so to speak, by building tools with a boutique software provider that would track our KPIs on the debt portfolio we managed, as well as manage controlling and portfolio stats and trend analysis. We did have a general ledger tool and a loan servicing system, but the other tools were internally customized uh, life cycle asset management type of systems. And of course, Excel. Um, after the um, recession around 2011-12, uh, I did some independent consulting before landing at Alliance Real Estate to establish the local finance and operations function for the US team. I had oversight of the loan servicing function for a, a while there and got back into software development again with various team projects. So it was always, I was a liaison. So I was a project manager working with the developers to kind of understand what the needs were for the business users. I, um, so what I've heard about prop tech and commercial real estate over the years has varied, but some of the earlier remembrances are that CRE, as, as Dan had mentioned and others, is, was late to the game, resistant to change, otherwise not coordinated, not collaborative with industry-wide opportunities that exist, right? We're just, we're just kind of dragging our heels. That may have been the case five years ago, but I, I am seeing kind of an, you know, more of a change, more of an acceptance, more relevance and likelihood of adoption as we're moving forward. And COVID I think is part of, the, part of that equation. Um, it certainly didn't hurt. Right before COVID, I attended a Fordham University panel that showcased several prop tech tools. Some very exciting things were happening. I learned about Nantum. Um, John Gilbert at Rudin Management explained how all of the building mechanicals and other environmental data are kind of combined to enhance efficiencies for owners and tenants. Amazing. Laura Patel was there from Density and she discussed this tool for office usage. So essentially without cameras or other personally identifiable data, you can make and develop trends. Omri Stern was there presenting from Jones and he is solving the insurance certificate renewals bottleneck, which enables property managers to scale their compliance requirements by tenfold. It, it's really, it seemed honestly so simple. A lot of this stuff seemed very, very, uh, you know, you, you would expect that this would have been solved a long time ago, but, but it's really, it's making, it's making um, traction. I attended a panel that demoed a construction software, and I mentioned this to Kate, that literally peeled back layers of a built out space by phase down to the curtain wall and the studs with pricing and pictures and calculations and measurements. So you can see at every phase of that building where you're spending your money and where the, the oversight is from an inspection standpoint and from a, a measurement standpoint. This all struck me as incredibly dynamic with applicability across the board for owners, managers, regulators, investors, the list goes on and on. 
from a financial results perspective at the highest level. If you're in asset management trying to understand your financial result, the bottom line is based on what you look at, what you took in, fees. <laughs> so your asset management fees are based on several things, including volumes, um, performance of the portfolio, what your new business is, who you're originating it with, where is that new business coming from, what are your managing costs, etc. All of this data is sitting in lots and lots of places, by, sometimes by business unit, sometimes by client, by product type. Harmonizing the data and filtering it and reporting it is critical to understanding the results. So from a prop tech perspective where I can offer some, some feedback is where I have been um, involved in some of the projects, um, you know, with the clients that I've represented. So one of the biggest challenges is when you have, you know, a client that has offices in multiple locations. So you're not only trying to solve the problem for how, how does this one particular office do it, but you have to harmonize that with other locations. And in fact, the, the, the Allianz team is, is global. So they're in APAC, they're in Europe, they're here, of course, in the US. So understanding the culture differences on top of the, the kind of um, terminology differences that can be slightly different from one place to the next. Um, you also want to benefit from the tools that PropTech offers off the shelf, somewhat off the shelf. I mean, certainly you'll have to customize, but having the um, the give and take to take, you know, a, an off the shelf product and kind of fine tune that versus you're starting from scratch or you're rebuilding something just to be completely customized to your own particular environment. It's a, it's a, it's a bit of a, a give and take, and it takes, it takes some time and some, some, um, and some definite, um, you have to, you have to compromise. So how the different tools are and data are interacting with each other creates transparency, right? And it provides opportunities for streamlining. You can see that you might have data in multiple places. Once you're going through that scoping and you're understanding what the client or what the business users are really looking for, you have an opportunity to take it even further. One of the projects I worked on recently was an investment proposal workflow approval process, lots of words, but basically every deal that we're going to do needs to get approved. And in order to do that, it is much better if you have a structured template with certain deliverables, with certain documentation, with certain you know, steps along the way that are going to be consistent. Again, obvious, but it, it didn't, it, we didn't have a harmonized approach before. So this is something that will ultimately streamline the workflow. And it's something that I was um, involved in more recently with our um, client relationship management tool that we're using. On the debt side, um, with, with, this, with this client, we have quarterly deliverables. Essentially every quarter for four or 500 properties, we're getting rent rolls and we're getting operating statements that need to be, then they're coming from 18 different vendors, places. They're all consolidated from the borrower standpoint, but then we're, we're ultimately consolidating them 18 different ways and then they're coming in. All of that got standardized when I was, when I was on board. So essentially having that upload making sure that those terms are consistent, that there, there are control checks in place before you're accepting that data. This is a helpful um, in order to save lots and lots of time. So you're not pulling up all of these, all of these numbers and trying to find that one piece that's, 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 that's kind of a, a variable. Um, Let's see, um, modeling. Of course, with the modeling of our investments, you know, we're using the Altus tools and we have done at Allianz um, a fair amount of customization um, for our business. And we are using the Argus Enterprise. We're using something called Talliance for the kind of overall structure level modeling. Um, and then there's, of course, the, um, the Voyanta, which is their data database, their data warehouse system. So working with all of that, um, involves, you know, feeds of data from one side to the other, but also the, the, it, it's helpful to understand where you're having indexes, where you might have market data that's relevant. So there's additional feeds. It's not, you know, certainly we were looking to collapse 30 tools into six. That was part of the strategy. But 
on top of that, you want to be efficient. You don't want to have to pull up a table from your Excel over and over and over again if you can automate that through some kind of interface. So building those APIs, um, depending on when when that's necessary, how how quickly and how um, you know how often you want that data to be kind of um, incorporated, whether it's a nightly feed, whether it's on demand. All of that is factoring into the overall kind of environment, ultimately, to manage, um, you know, what that result is. We would also look to prop tech to manage exposure. So in our portfolio, we have limits, perhaps, on entities, um, on regions, on geographies, on property types. All of that needs to be embedded into the tools that we're using so that there are no manual um, errors. So we're not all of a sudden lending to a particular uh, city where we've already exceeded the threshold for that particular area. So th those are some examples of where PropTech becomes relevant from an asset management perspective. On the document management side, um, our document management system, it's one of the hardest challenges is, is having those tags, having, having a way to kind of find the document you're looking for very quickly. So a lot of that work is done up front. So finding what is the, what is the right type of hierarchy of your files for the particular teams or functional areas in order to um, be intentional about setting that up at the beginning. And that's another thing that I have, um, I've been involved in. Um, you know, when you talk about um, tools beyond the just the, the performance, um, you know, as an institutional asset manager, you're you always want to be a good corporate citizen and ESG and DEI initiatives are relevant. They're important and how we automate that and how we're using prop tech to bring that in. Allianz uses measurable. And I think that's something that may be familiar to the prop to the women in prop tech team or group um, from some, some earlier um, kind of um, sessions you might have had but um we we look for you know what is your carbon footprint how is the carbon being reduced what what are the measures that that you're taking as local law 97 becomes more and more re relevant um here there's going to be you know absolute tracking of that um so that there's there's more um transparency around that and on the DEI side, you know, looking at looking at diversity, equity, inclusion trends, and um, just it, it all flows into, um, you know, as as an institutional investor, an institutional player, you have to demonstrate that you are making progress and you're improving that landscape. So that's also, um, you know, something to look at. There's a tax filing tickler tool that, that that we're looking at. There's on the legal documentation when you're when you're um, if you're churning out you know a decent volume of loans on a regular basis, it becomes practical to take some of those um, terms that are in the legal documents and and just pull them into your database. So that's that's another um, opportunity for prop tech to be involved. Um, and then I think uh, just taking a look at some of my notes here, I think that might be, yeah, I think those are, those are some of the some of the um, observations and, and feedback I have on on prop tech um, for how for how it works with um, you know asset management. So okay, thank you. All right, that's that's really interesting. I definitely want to come back with a couple of questions about what what you have been talking about here. We do have some questions. Um, that came in on the chat thing. So let me start out. Uh, Nikki, you had one that was coming in and I know I have, I, I'd like to make a connection between Jennifer and Dan on uh, some other things. So let's go with Rachel's question first from Nikki and then, um, then head on. Um, so so this, this one, what would an optimal tech stack look like? How do you strategize combining clunky legacy systems <laughs> along with some of the newer emergency technologies? It's tough. It's tough because you know people people the change change management is what it all boils down to, right? Because nobody wants to change what they're doing, even if it takes a lot of extra time. So working through kind of what the priorities are, I would say, is is the most helpful to to say, okay, if 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 you're looking at all of these inefficiencies where where is this where's the one piece that's going to save you the most time and let's start there let's just let's just tackle one of those steps i mean quite frankly 
Um, you know, some of the stuff that we implemented locally was only implemented locally because it, it was it was uh, unique to the to the team, as opposed to the the global function overall. And some, and that's where you do have to be cognizant of why would you why would you spend all of this extra time and money to standardize all of these different areas if if it's not ultimately going to matter. So uh, you know, looking looking at clunky legacy systems, a lot of it a lot of it also has to do with price. I mean, you know, some some of the clunkier older systems are expensive. And so looking at looking at new um, new apps and new software that that's kind of running on a subscription basis and um, you know kind of managing budgets is is going to help as well so i would say that's um that's some some guidance there okay i see a question from peter smith but we have some other ones come in um and this is i think for all of the panelists um and it's a pretty lengthy one it would be great to hear specifics about what has worked and what hasn't worked bringing back staff to a live environment have you dealt with the ever-changing school closures that are going on between virtual and hybrid. Uh, for those who have transitioned back, what are the drivers in doing so? So I think what I'm gonna do is ask Dan first to, to that question, what specifically has worked in reopening hospitality with layering prop tech and what hasn't worked? Well, I'm not going to sit here now and tell you that the uh, the cleanliness and sanitation efforts have worked, right? I proved that one already. That hasn't worked. Um, you, you know, it's interesting. The What comes to mind is mobile key technology has actually been around for quite some time. Uh, it's it, it was previously reserved for elite uh, uh, members of frequent traveler programs, right? Now it's like I told you before. Marriott now has a system-wide mandate, uh, with date certain that that everybody has to have that available. Um, so I would say that you know that that finally worked, right? It, it it really wasn't working before. It was available, but it really wasn't being taken advantage of. Um, you know, I do believe that uh, the robot technology and uh, you know killing germs. Um, is is a is a technology that still has 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 legs and and uh, I think you're going to see more and more of that going on. So I, I you know we're starting to see you know green shoots of 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 positivity for new technology getting adopt uh, uh, um, adopted uh, to the sector. Okay, great. So that's interesting. The robot thing really caught my attention. I'm going to have to say I, I had a mental picture of tripping over it in the middle of the night when I've had one too many glasses of champagne, but, but that's just me. Um, Jen, here's the question for you that you, that came in earlier. It is predictions for returning to work based on the Intel you have from some of the people that you were talking to even today, whether systems and buildings are going to be clean enough that people will feel confident and coming in, whether the monitoring is in place to make people feel like they can come back and not have to leave again. Jen, you're on mute. Pardon me, I forgot to unmute. Um, I was just in three Times Square the other day and uh, right before New Year's too, and it was like so sad. The, the Times Square was empty, obviously. The building was empty. I was the only person in like a 20 story office building in Times Square. Um, except for the, some guys pulling some cables. So anyway, the point is, is that when I went in there, they did check my temperature. I mean, everywhere I have gone, there's been some kind of thing in place. So when the, the, the numbers start increasing, I don't know um, if they'll use, I like Dan's picture. Like it, it was kind of like um, from the old uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger movie about Mars or something where they tested everyone when they went through the airport with the, with the thermal recognition software. I mean, if they have that and they can adopt that, it might solve you know, whatever is the next COVID. I mean, there, you know, because these things are, are mutating too, we, we want to be, you know, we, we want to be ready for the next, you know, I, I what you, the black swan event, Dan, you said it right. It was, it was a black swan event, although it was kind of, you know, black swans, are, I think are more un, unknown or un, we kind of didn't plan for this one, but anyway, um, I don't know. This was unknown and we didn't plan for it. <laughs> That's true. Well, I mean, I kind of knew in the back, I had already gotten enough toilet paper, so I was okay. But I, cause I saw in February, I'm like, this one could be the one where, you know, 
I, I've been, I follow these all the time. I've been following them for years and I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be the one. And I could not well, believe that it was the one, but well. whatever. I, I, getting back to that, I, I think that like me, we use those nano um, particulate things that we have on all our surfaces that we open doors with that work. So we're, you know, we're hoping that, I mean, I think other people are using these same technologies, um, but I think everyone's doing it differently. It depends on your budget. It depends on if you're planning on being in it for the long haul. There's some people that are, some business owners I've been talking to that are maybe, you know, giving up the ghost, or, uh, but w whatever the case may be, wherever you are in the spectrum, and Rachel like, was at the highest level of the Allianz. I love your stories of what you did at Allianz. And um, I feel like I'm a tiny little peon compared to what you've done in terms of prop tech and getting the, a huge portfolios under, under organizational management and getting them you know, more efficient and more operationally effective. Uh, but when, in terms of the environmental, it's always you know, something new. So I, I really, it's hard to say what, what people will be doing, but I'm telling you, a lot of the people I've been having meetings with or talking with are not going back for the foreseeable future. Uh, 100 year old engineering companies, you know, banks. I mean, so I do feel like there will be um, more vaccinations and more, more herd immunity by the time people are ready to more, go back to work more fully. So that will be one of the protections that we will have as well as the ventilations, which are a lot of the stuff we're working on like three times square, increasing their ventilation, opening up spaces so they're not so congested. Uh, those are all things that are gonna, they're, that people have been working on. We've been doing a lot of these type of projects. The only things we're doing in the building department we're filing any projects are jobs to do th just that, to open up space or to make them more uh, so that there's fewer people in the space, so, like there's not, or, you know, they're, re they're realigning their spatial needs is what people are doing. So those are all things. I can't really tell you what the outcome will be, but I, I, if I think of anything while we're talking on this call, I will, I'll make sure I okay. voice it up. Okay. Well, Peter, we'll come back to your question because it was valuation and I wanted Dan to handle it because he's got the most volatile, there he is right there. Um, Dan, Peter Smith, who's up in the corner over there and enjoying his retirement. Um, you look familiar. Is, uh, I can't hear He was formerly with EY. So, oh, okay. um, he yeah, looks very you picked a good time to retire, to... Pete. Huh? You picked a good time to retire. I don't know when you Didn't retired. I but... just, are you kidding? I couldn't believe it. Anyway, I, I have an anecdote <laughs> to think about that in a moment. But anyway, sorry, Dan. Dan, the question was, how is prop tech and COVID, I think you were asking that, Peter. How are they, the brew that's, that creates that, where is it going to shake out on value? I mean, oh, wow. is, is PropTech going to be able to increase value or just prevent it from dropping it, further? It's, it's the hotel business is, is constantly changing and, and fluid. You talk about an asset class that, that uh, forget about physical obsolescence, but from a functional perspective, they 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 become functionally obsolete quite quickly, right? Uh, think about your you know typical. Well, think about fifteen hundred room convention center hotels, big boxes. I referred to earlier, right? Those today are sort of functionally obsolete. Um, I lost track of what was the question again? We're talking about we're talking about valuation. How the uh, right, right. is okay. prop so, tech going to be able to you know help stem every, the bleed? Everybody, everybody's going to have to go with mobile check-in. So each initiative talked about. Once one does it, they're all. It's sort of like the airlines, right? It's and so from a value proposition, yeah, I guess you could say that it, at a minimum it's going to hold value. You know. It, Theoretically, it should increase value as well, but at a minimum, for sure, hold value, um, because you know if you don't stay up with the with the with the with the latest and greatest, particularly now, again, that technology. I mean, I've been doing this forty years, right? Forty years ago, technology was nothing to me and to everybody else in the world, right? When I grew up, we had black and white TV with nine channels, all right, so. You know, it, and, 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 and the, the, you know, the, the, the advances of technology are rapidly, uh, um, exponentially, in, you know, increasing in terms of speed coming to market. And so, um, yeah, I think if, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't do it, you're going to very quickly 
fall behind and frankly, you know, won't be able to meet brand standards, whether they be formal brands or what's referred to as soft brands. Um, so it's, it's the ante to stay in the game. A hundred percent. Okay. All right. All right, Rachel, batting it over to you here. You have a lot of investors that are asking questions about what's going on. Where's my money going? What's happening with all of this? Um, how were you able to stay in touch with them on that kind of one-on-one -on -one basis through something like this? Because there are big numbers involved in what you do, but you still have to get them to the investors. So, so with touch points, you're saying you say along the way yes. with how are the, how are the investors hearing about what's what's going on? Yeah, I mean, our our um, our infrastructure was has been strong through through COVID. I mean, we we Allianz is just a giant of, of an organization and has lots of specialties and lots of outsourcing within their big big company. So, so we we were relatively seamless as far as um, layers of communication. Certainly on the um, um, the due diligence front, we're not going out, we weren't going out potentially to see properties directly, we weren't looking at inspections on a regular basis. So that's, but that was outsourced, making the making the investors feel comfortable that we are on top of the portfolio and the, and the changes. Um, it just it just comes from um, all of the all of we have, we have very robust um, kind of data coming into us on a re very, very regular basis. And that didn't stop from COVID looking at those trends and running risk um, and portfolio management analyses with with different types of scenario analysis was able to um, we were able to react very quickly with with investor questions and, and comments that they had. Okay, that's super. Um, Peter, you want to tell us a story about retirement? Oh, since this is now a conversation no, no. among friends, I don't want to upset people by talking about retirement. But I, but no, I, I was just thinking of the irony that that as I as as Kate said, I work for a small neighborhood accounting firm called Ernst and Young for. 15 years and and they went through the year before i left they went through this big huge change of their office space uh, planning they moved all of the exterior offices inside you know it, nobody had individual offices anymore and they went through a vast amount of money creating more space to cram people into um and and now of course it's got to reverse itself now they've got to make six foot circles around every workspace and that takes away two you know, that they had already put there. So the investment just seems like cr a crazy thing to do. Now uh, the black swan has flown in and landed and they've got to change it all again. So I just thought that was an interesting way that, that, that this pandemic has affected their, their footprint. Okay. Well, I think we've covered an awful lot of ground here. Um, and given the fact that we've got a nice small group here I think if there's any other questions that any of you want to ask of each other, I mean, monitoring systems or anything like that, and then I think we can wrap. You know, it's it's funny that, um, you know, we're talking about hybrid approaches when Dan was talking about the, the hotels and conventions. I just heard, I don't have kids in school right now, my kids are older, but the people, but in my community, people are zooming into their school and they're also attending in person. And it is very tough to, to kind of bridge the gap of the in per, addressing the in-person people with the people on the Zoom adequately. So the teachers are typically picking one audience and ignoring the other. <laughs> so I'm wondering how that's gonna play out with bigger kind of more corporate type of things because it's it's tough to pivot that way, at least from the education side, from, from people, from friends that I've talked to. Oh, you know, I saw something earlier on in, in, the, in the epidemic about maybe four months ago, and it was Michael Bloomberg speaking, um, maybe it was to the Goldman Sachs people or something, I think it was Goldman Sachs related the thing I did. And he said that he used to go into the office and he would stay the latest and he made sure he rode down the elevator with all the senior executives and they would make sure they saw his face, that he was there late like them and he was trying to like earn brownie points by being the guy who was like there and gets the, you know, the promotion and stuff. How is that going to affect how people move up in an environment or, or in a world, in, a, in, a, in a, an organization? It's going to, there's going to be so many things that this has affected besides what we're talking about just in property, but just in people's careers, their lives. 
you know, maybe millennials, I mean, I'd like to hear from some of the younger people. Are you guys enjoying, because I, I kind of am kind of really getting sick of the, the Zoom stuff. I love it. And I love certain parts of it, but I do like the camaraderie and the interchange that you get from a real office environment. Is anyone feeling the same or am I just crazy? I am. I, I can't wait yeah. to go back. <laughs> yeah. Can't wait. Yeah. Do you have young children at home, by the way, or no, just because you just can't wait to go back to see people and stuff? Uh, it's just me, which makes it worse. And um, during COVID, I, I moved from New York City to uh, Plano, Texas uh, for work, which makes it, you know, additionally worse. So, so yeah, I can't um, wait to go back into the office. Now, did you move to Plano, Texas because your job relocated you there or did you go back home for? Uh, no, my job relocated. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. At least you have your job. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I know my friend moved back to Canada because she lost her, you know, she was a, a, a consultant and she, you know, she couldn't afford New York City anymore. So she's gone back to Canada, unfortunately, for now. But she plans on coming back one day if she can. Is that our, is that our, our shrimp and grits? Yes, it is. It's our little <laughs> fireball. She's about four feet tall woman. She's a, yeah, a fireball hair. network she's... if you want to check her out. She's got great networking tips if you want to learn more about being a better networker, especially now it's hard to network. This is our networking group here in a way. Yeah. And, um, and she also, if you want to polish up your resume or your LinkedIn profile, uh, her name is Dina and it is fireball network. Cause she's a little fireball. Yes. So, Dina uh, so anyway, yeah.